the power of pork. What does that mean? Well, I'm here to talk to you as a, uh, I've spent uh, the last 30 years in swine research at the University of Illinois, uh, managing the research farms and teaching on campus, and took the buyout in 2010. So that's, uh, I find myself working for National Pork Board now. Um, what we're going to talk about this morning is about the modern in pork industry, farming in general, and modern farming, and how it affects the safety and nutrition of our food. If we uh, look at the statistics from the World Health Organization, we see that by 2050, the population of the world will increase one-third to about 9.3 billion people. And their demand for food will need to be met by an increase in production of approximately 100% of what we're doing right now. So we've got to double production. How much of the earth is tillable and used for farming? Anybody have a guess? Sir? 80%. One thirty-second of the Earth's area is available for farming. You think about all the oceans, the climates where it's not uh, possible to raise, it's too arid or too cold. Uh, one thirty-second of the Earth, and in that thirty-second, we can only use the top four or five feet is what provides the nutrients for the, the food that we all eat. Also, how much water is available? The water that's available to raise food. Think about this very carefully. One half of one percent of all the water on earth is what's used to raise food. So those are very limited, finite volumes of land availability and water. And without modern farming practices and improvement through education, research, we will not be able to meet that need of a hungry population. And so we get, a, we get a lot of people talking about, you know, this dislike for modern farming. But let me tell you, there's going to be a lot of hungry people if we don't continue to advance. Farming started about 10,000 years ago. It took several jumps in technology along the way, but when the Industrial Revolution came about and we shifted people from the farm to town, we started to see a lot more need for increasing production. And so that's when land-grant colleges came into being. And so we developed uh, research education training for farmers to do a better job. And so that's where we are today. So if we're going to use, we're not making any more of that land, and the water is a very limited amount, so it's going to be very important. If we look at what's happened today, uh, milk production is a tremendous example. 1944, the, uh, we have the quadrupled the production from a cow since 1944. But with that, she uses 65% less water and 70% less land than she did in 1944. If you look at the modern farmer today, 1960s, he fed 25 people. So in 50 plus years, he now feeds 155 people. So we've, we've, we've done a better job, more efficiently. Remember, we still got the same amount of land. Rice production, wheat production, they both have increased. Um, 1960s, an acre of wheat would feed six people. Or, excuse me, feed two people. Today it'll feed six people. So it increased in production. Rice. 1960s, it fed about four people per acre. Today, it's doubled. It's at eight people per acre. But you see, those are great increases, but what do we do in the next 50 years? That becomes the challenge. In the pork industry, we've seen our production since 1959 has doubled. Yet, we're doing that with 45% less water, 80% less energy, and a carbon footprint that represents only one-third of 1% one of all the carbon emissions in the, in the world. If we look at how 
we have evolved. And I'll use the pork industry today as my example because that's who I represent. But it, it holds true for most other industries. We have seen in the, and I'm skipping forward quite a bit on the pro, my program here, but we'll see where we end up. Um, if we look at the 1970s, what was taking place? You people are involved in food and food, uh, teaching other people how to prepare, understand, work with food, family uh, things that you would do. 1970s, we started to realize the connection between fat in our diet and our nutritional health. And so, what did that do? Well, about 1979, the pork industry stepped back and said, you know what, we don't have a product that meets that need. We, our pigs were too fat, so obviously the pork was too fat. And there wasn't a demand for lard anymore, because after World War II, we really didn't need that, because we'd, a guy named Wesson came up with corn oil, and uh, Mazola and uh, all of those other products became much cheaper to produce, and certainly better for us than the, than the lard. And we didn't need it for munitions, because we'd pretty well finished up with the war. So, we need to get rid of that fat. What did we do? Well, now I'm sure a lot of you have heard of pork, the other white meat. Well, that wasn't just a clever campaign slogan. That represented millions, tens of millions of dollars in research that went into developing selective breeding and genetic selection for leaner pigs, improving nutrition so that we could meet the need of that leaner pig and feed it so it stayed lean, and also management practices that would change. And that's where the great step came. Today, most modern pork production is raised in a, a building that has controlled environment and, and is specialized for those animals that are in there. Now, before I move any further, I've always told my students in classes where I taught uh, animal handling and introductory animal science, think about it. Just think a little bit. We took an animal from outdoors in his natural environment and we moved him inside into a building. Now outside he was responsible, he, the animal, was responsible for controlling his environment, controlling whether he was hungry or thirsty. That was their job. Whose job is it today? It is our moral obligation to take care of those animals. They represent our livelihood, for one, and it's the right thing to do. And so as we develop buildings, we develop them with the care and individual nutrition, individual care, medication, health of that animal. Animals that were raised outside were subject to the weather, and they were subject to all kinds of uh, health risks. But we can control that now that we have them inside. And we get kind of a bad rap. People want to throw rocks at us about the way we do it. You know what? I've got nothing against people that want to have a vegan lifestyle. That's their own cultural change or cultural choice. But those people who profess that everybody should be vegan shouldn't be trying to make rules to tell us how to raise pigs. And that's what we're finding in some of the legislation that gets put forward by, for instance, the Humane Society of the U.S. Anybody know what that is? Or who they are? You ever donated money to them? Well, you know, they, they spend a lot of money on these very tearful pleas using usually an actress holding a three-legged dog that's blind in one eye and trying to get people to donate money. And I'm not trying to be facetious because there is a need there. The problem is they gathered $140 million last year and only spent 400000 on helping pets. They do not represent your local health or, or uh, shelter. They are a, an entity that is set up to lobby in Washington to promote a vegan lifestyle. Their vice president, Wayne Pacelli, has testified before Congress that he will see that no one in this United States eats red meat 
or any meat of, at all. Well, that's not the guy I want designing pro how I do my business. I think that we've, we've gone past, though, what I would call the science-based uh, decision-making. We've reached into an emotional decision-making, and this becomes part of the problem when we transfer our emotions of, of human emotion to animals. So consequently, that's part of what we address today is our image. That, in fact, that's why I'm here. I started in this program four years ago and have presented about 100 speeches because I want to try to educate people. I want to educate you to the point that you can make your own decision. If you think we ought to be doing something different, that's fine. But at least I had the opportunity to show you what we're trying to do. Now, we've designed programs called Pork Quality Assurance that ensures that everyone who raises pigs and sells them into the market has, has to be certified. And that certification comes through the National Pork Board. We do the same thing with the trucking industry. Every trucker who hauls pigs has at least been trained and certified, and they have to retrain and recertify every three years. Meaning, what, what, how do we enforce that? If I back up to the plant to unload a pig, the first thing they ask me for is my TQA certification as a driver and the PQA certification from the producer that sent those pigs to town. Without that, you can't market them. So that, you know, it doesn't mean that there's not still people out there that aren't bad actors. You tell me one industry that you can't point to someone that doesn't do it right. But at least we put them all on the same bases and we've got them all at least thinking about it. And I think that, that's the only thing that I can commend HSUS and some of the other PETA, for instance. They raised the question. And believe me, it, it raised the debate and it, it forced us to look at ourselves. And that's what we've tried to answer. Well, let's talk a little more about just pork in general. Well, first, let me tell you, let me tell you a little story. Modern pork production has, has moved inside, and it's still the choice of some operators to be outside. The thing is, uh, with these buildings that we've built, we have very specialized facilities. And those facilities are designed for each of the phases of production. So we have a breeding barn where the animals the sows, that's the adult females, are mated and they stay there and gestate for 114 days. Then they're moved to a birthing facility and that is specifically designed to house the female and her litter. And these are done individually so we can control, again, their health and their nutrition. And again, you know, it's our job to provide feed and water. Now, a lot of people say we shouldn't use gestation crates. Well, here's the thing. If you've got 4,000 sows, I can't remember them all by name. But if I put them in a place where I can follow through each day, a record is kept on each of those animals. And so they get all their shots timely, they, you know, the vaccinations and those kind of things. The sow, the mother pig, lays down and she'll have 10 to 13 piglets. Average weight is about 3 pounds each. At 21 days, they'll be weaned and moved to a nursery that's specially designed for that young piglet. And the nutrition is designed to meet his every need. Think about it. He's kind of weaning. What does that mean? Well, he's not drinking milk anymore. So what is, what is that feed going to need to fulfill what he's, he needs? It's got to have a lot of milk solids, whey, a lot of particular protein that's easily digested. And so we've designed as many as eight diets through the phases of production. We move that pig out of the nursery. He weighs about 50 pounds. He goes to a, a finishing unit where there's a lot more space, and he'll stay there until he's about 270 pounds and goes to market at an age of 175 to 180 days of age. So he went from three-pound baby to 270 pounds in under six months. And we can only do that with efficient, well-kept, and healthy animals, which ensures a safe, leaner, more nutritious food supply for us. 
In 2006, we hit a milestone. USDA determined that pork tenderloin was leaner than skinless chicken breast. Take a second for that to soak in. Did you, any of you think that? You know? If you take three ounces of pork tenderloin, it will have about 2.98 grams of fat. Three ounces of skinless chicken breast is about 3.01. Now we beat them according to USDA standards. If you compare it to lean sirloin at about 6.98 grams, it's quite a lot better. So pork tenderloin is a, is a specific meat of choice for a lean, healthy diet. Anybody know where the tenderloin comes from? I have a really nice picture that would show you, but I'll, we'll skip past that. Are we ready to go again? Okay, well this may take a second to get caught up. I think I've been kind of all over the board, so. Would you like me to do it for you? Yeah, let's, you roll and I'll, you click them and I'll. All right. Go ahead, just stop right, well, you know what, just go ahead. There's no reason to watch this video. I've told everybody. The one thing I didn't mention is we have, we're adding about 200,000 people a day to the United States. What does that mean? Well, that's another LA, another Chicago about every 30 days. Okay? Yes, ma'am. All right. We've talked about this. Roll right on. Keep rolling. Whoop, stop just a second. Okay, and we don't need to talk about that. Okay, let's look at this a second. How many of you choose to eat the pork chop on the left? Well, this is my left. I guess it'd be my right if I'm facing you. Pretty appealing, isn't it? Well, that's what it used to be. And now we're more like this. This is what we've accomplished. We've actually got a higher percentage of protein and certainly a lot less fat. Okay. We talked about pigs were raised outside. Some of the problems with that, you know, this is kind of altruistic. This is what, you know, do you think that sow dreams of being on a creek bank in tall grass? Laying in this, basking in the sun? No. Is she hungry? Is she thirst, thirsty? Is she comfortable? And are her piglets well taken care of? That's our job now. Because this is, the next one is what? This is what we got to avoid. Okay. We look at some of these modern facilities which I've talked to you about. Um, we can roll on. Roll on. Okay, here's the birthing center we talked about. Um, just a quick note. Why is there a heat lamp in here? That temperature around those babies is about 90 to 95 degrees. They come into the world at 100.5, and they're wet. They do not thermonuclear, they do not thermoregulate for about 48 hours, and they can't sense heat but they can sense light. And so that's why we put this in here. The room itself is about 65 degrees because that's what keeps mom comfortable. Okay? Yes, ma'am. Now there's the nursery where the little guys go for a while. Roll on. And this would be a, a finisher where they would go. As I said, it's got lots of fresh air. One point I need to make is in order to control disease, we power wash these buildings and disinfect them twice before the next group of pigs moves through. And this ensures a break in the buildup of any kind of bacteria or disease. It also gives them a nice, clean, fresh environment to come into. Yes, ma'am. Okay. One of the things we've noticed, and I've talked about this a little bit, is biosecurity. Most of our facilities you have to shower in. You'll put on coveralls, boots that are in the facility so that you can't bring something in with you. If you've been by other pigs, we demand 72 hours of downtime. You can't come from, we've found that a lot of viruses can live about 48 hours uh, in your hair and in your nostrils. So we don't want that contamination. Anything else that comes into the unit, uh, we demand that uh, tools be, you know, like you like, call an electrician, his tools have to be sterilized wiped down and clean before they come in, as well as everything else. One thing I must say is, 
How many people in this room have children? Several of you. And you that don't will learn. If your child's sick, what are you going to do to try to get them well? Anything it takes. Whatever it takes. Well, that's the same way we treat our animals. We will take care of them. It's our, again, our moral obligation to make sure that they're healthy. Now, if that means if we have to use a treatment or medication, it, one, is approved by FDA only and prescribed by a veterinarian. So we're not out here just willy-nilly throwing antibiotics around. Yes, ma'am. Again, we've talked about this. This is a... Okay. We're, I think we're caught up. Thank you. The uh, American Heart Association did us a great favor in 2012. They finally certified Tenderloin as heart healthy. And, you know, what does that mean? Well, it means that we can put that red check on a package of Tenderloin and people that are searching for a heart healthy diet can choose to select it. It's more easily recognized in the meat counter. You'll see it on, uh, on restaurants uh, menus. You'll see the heart healthy check for those diets or those menus that are uh, more prescribed for people that need to watch that. Yes, ma'am. Let's look at the, today's pork is very high in minerals and vitamins. Um, you all are nutritionists by some degree. What does thiamine do? Anybody know? I'm sorry? You have an answer? Okay. Well, let, we won't belabor this, but you can get 54% of your daily needs from three ounces of tenderloin, and it controls the development of neuroreceptors. It also is in, in play with uh, uh, phytokinase, uh, excuse me, phosphokinase. Uh, energy and, and metabolism of carbohydrates. We roll on. Again, we've talked about this. Look at the caloric profile. 122 for three ounces of pork tenderloin roasted. Uh, 2.98 in fat, which makes it the lowest. Cholesterol is lower than any of those products. And it's also lower in sodium. Now that's a fresh pork product. Okay. Here's the great, great thing that happened finally. We have now, did everybody realize this? We've lowered the cooking temperature of pork to 145 by USDA standards. Now, people that ate a lot of pork knew this long before USDA made that claim. One of the things that they were held up on making this public was they wanted to test trichinosis. Do you know what? They couldn't find it. They couldn't find it to test it. Because there hasn't been a case of trichinosis in 75 years from modern pork. But Grandma always told us to better cook it, cook it, cook it to 160. All your thermometers said 165, you know, for pork. 160, 165. What I would like to tell you is this applies to whole cuts. Pork chops, tenderloin, uh, roasts, ham, shoulders, but ground pork still needs to be cooked to 160. And again, think about it. That's an amalgam. That's a ground product that's got lots of surface area and lots of opportunities for little things to happen. And it's dependent upon who cleaned the machine last as to what that level is. Now, I'm not saying it's bad. I'm just saying you need to cook it to 160. Everything's cool. It took me a long time to get re used to that little bit of pink in, in a pork chop. You know, that's what we order steak, medium rare. And that's approximately what that would be, is a medium rare. But I can tell you today, I'll give you a good example. My mother-in-law lives in Elmhurst. And I don't know, it's probably been 20 years ago. She came to me and she said, I used to cook a ro pork roast every week. And I quit doing it because they're not, not any good. And I said, well, just take a knife and stick it in my heart. You know, come on. And I said, well, what are you doing? You cook it just like you used to? 350, six hours, done, throw it on the table. It's so dry you can't eat it. 
Yes. <laughs> well, dear, that's the problem. This, just think about it. If we look back at that pork chop we saw, that fat isn't there to protect it all. And so now, unless you're going to wrap it in bacon or slather it in lard, you better cook it to 145 or you won't enjoy it. You know, the thing is, I can produce the best piece of pork in the world, put it in a meat counter, and 80% of quality is in your control after you get it home. And you all realize that because that's what you're trying to train. If you keep it at 145, it's a lot more pleasant. Yes, ma'am. It's very versatile. You can, I, I use probably more pork than most of you in this room, I'm sure. But you can intersperse pork anywhere you would chicken breast. I uh, don't have any problem with that. Uh, go to ilpork.org, and there's seven to 9,000 recipes. I don't know, it goes up every day. Uh, we've got a whole series of recipes for 30-minute meals. I was just telling the lady over here that uh, my last talk to a group like this, which was uh, your same backgrounds, um, I prepared tenderloin Dijon in about 10 minutes. And uh, it's easy. It's dead easy using tenderloin. I was there, Bill. It was good. Yeah, uh, thank you. There we go. A, a testimony from the crowd. Very good. All right. Uh, we have also, you've probably seen our clever jingles. You hear the music, I hear it, and I, I know exactly what the commercial is. The Be Inspired. Well, I think that's the key here. Uh, pork has become the number one growth meat, meaning there's more pork being consumed now than ever before, and it's leading. I mean, let's, let's face it, when we're talking about dollars for protein choice, how does it compare with beef today? Pretty tough comparison. When hamburger, in some places, the extra lean is trading at over $5 a pound, I mean, that's, and, and who would eat 73%? For goodness sake. Yes, ma'am. By the way, one of the things that's, that's handicapped ground pork over the years as being a good substitute is you don't find a lot of market share for it. And it used to be it was always just whatever the butcher had trimmings left over, he'd grind up and either make into fresh sausage or fresh ground pork. But it's gaining a little bit of ground. We just spent $2 million last year in a ground pork campaign in the Chicago area with a thing with Domix and Jewel Foods and the Chicago Bears called the Burger. Anybody heard of the De Burger campaign? Well, that's us. Uh, now, I'd, I wouldn't recommend that for the faint of heart. It's an eight ounce patty of burger, six ounces of pulled pork, four pieces of bacon, and two slices of cheese on a sesame seed bun. <laughs> it's, it's a meal in itself, if you will. Let's look at, uh, I'm sorry, let's look at our cuts. I'd like to find the guy that was the butcher that named the shoulder the Boston butt. Boy, was he confused. I mean, it's on the wrong end. Well, the leg becomes the ham here. It's typically from here. The side is our number one selling item in the world today is the, the baby back rib and bacon. Everybody's decided to put bacon on everything. It became a condiment after, uh, what, uh, what was it? Uh, Jack in the Box served some raw burgers up in the Northwest, and son of, suddenly they figured out they got to put taste back in if they got to cook it. So they put bacon on it. The arm or shoulder is the lower part of that. The upper part of the blade is the Boston shoulder or Boston butt. You'll see it advertised that way, boneless butt. That's pretty flimsy. Then we have the loin, is the large muscle, and I won't bore you with the scientific terms, but it is the longissimus dorsi. And underneath it is the tenderloin. So if we look at that, when you see that rib down here and the chine bone here, this big muscle up here is the, is the loin, and the little muscle down underneath here that doesn't get a lot of motor action is the tenderloin, same as the filet mignon, if you will, from the tenderloin of beef. Okay. Okay, we've become a
quote on the A-list, and I don't know, I'm not a uh, trendologist, but that's supposed to be good. But in scientific journals, health publications, and a lot of con consumer media. How many people in here watch the Food Channel? Oh, yeah. Have you noticed how much more pork we cook today? You know, chefs are econ economists, too. And, and again, that center of the plate cost of protein or entree based on what you can get is pork because it's a blank palate. It'll accept and work with whatever you want to work with. Let's move on. Well, we've shown <clears throat> in nutrition and research that it is a substantial source of key nutrients and it helps limit the calories when it's eaten. Next, please. Federation of American Societies of Experimental Biology. Say that really quick. People who choose to eat lean, low-fat meat tend to eat more vegetables and fruits. Does that make sense? They've made a conscious choice to eat a leaner piece of meat. So they're going to eat a better diet, hopefully. And so that becomes ultimately important. Next, please. If we look at the European Journal of Clinical Nutrition, a hunter-gatherer diet that includes lean meats such as pork tenderloin can significantly reduce cholesterol. And we've already shown that, that it's lower than even chicken. Okay. Tufts University says it's one of the 51 healthy foods you should eat because it provides about 32% of our daily protein need with just three ounces. Yes, ma'am. Uh, and here again, Restaurant News says the versatility of it is, uh, is wonderful. And as I mentioned, we've certainly got more chefs buying in. Yes, ma'am? Go the other way. There we go. And Men's Health suggests it's one of the six superfoods because it's so much higher in selenium than beef and, uh, and chicken. Yes, ma'am? This, again, a bit of an advertisement for National Pork Board. We have put together this porkandhealth.org and you'll get uh, our nutritionist's advice. Um, we've also got those uh, several menus that are designed around heart healthy diets and, and good nutritional choices. Yes ma'am. What? We're the number one pork producer in the world and 30 percent of our supply from the United States goes overseas. What does that mean? And I'm not going to elaborate too much on this, but that last year, pardon me, in 2011, mounted to six billion plus dollars in trade. Our most discerning customer in the world is Japan, and we sell about 30 percent of our exports to Japan. But why do people want pork from the United States? It's available from every place else. Number one, it's the safest, it's the most nutritious, and leanest, and healthiest of any of them out there on the market. And this goes back to a previous discussion we just had. If we regulate an industry out of business, it becomes a matter of choice. And we put price of production at a point where only certain few people in this world will be able to, to uh, buy meat. Now, the alternative is you would buy it from overseas. We haven't got any control over how they do it. So let's don't beat up the guy that's doing it here and trying to do it right. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Again, I talked about this just a little bit. You know, the way I look at it, we have a social lion, uh, License is what we need to earn. When we poll customers and consumers in focus groups and this, that, and the other, we find that nearly, nearly 100% of the people think that farmers are competent, meaning they know how to do the job and they, they get up early, they work hard, they're trustworthy, hardworking people, but when it comes to confidence, they're not real sure we're doing the right thing. Okay, you understand. They, they think we're good at it, 
but they're not sure that we're, we're confident or their confidence in us to do the right thing is low. So again, that's what I say. We have to push that balance of social license to a point where we meet that need too. Okay? Well, we've done a lot of things to try to improve pork. Some of those areas being the amount of sodium that's in cured meats. See, a great percentage of that pig goes into cured meats, whether it be hot dogs, bacon, ham. You know, those are a lot of the poundage, if you will. And we've got hot dogs now that uh, are as low as 250. We're working on some deli meats. They get them down to 35 milligrams of sodium. Um, you know, it's, it's one of those processes we've got to work on because we know it doesn't represent a healthy diet. Yes, ma'am. Uh, we've now got USDA standards where Canadian bacon and ham can, can be considered lean meats. How many times you pick up ham and it's 96% lean? Uh, Canadian bacon's about probably 97, maybe 98 in some cases. Yes, ma'am. Antibiotic use. I'm sure everybody in here has some feeling about that. Or you've heard some things. Well, I'm here to tell you, and again, you make up your own mind. We do not use antibiotics lightly. One, they're expensive. And we're not going to go out and give them if we don't have to. So they're only used on animals that are sick or have been exposed to sickness. Yes, ma'am. Everything that goes through, that's fed to an animal, it goes through an FDA study. And I've, I've monitored more than one in my life. And it's a very rigorous process. And expensive, too. But we can't get anything approved. You know, it's, it's really, it is odd. I know we did a test one time on a product that they would not allow to be fed to pigs, but I could go over to GNC and buy it right off the shelf. Doesn't make a lot of sense, does it? Go ahead. CDC, National Institutes of Health, or allergies, have told Congress that there's no definitive link between the use of antibiotics and, and the resistance in humans. There's not been one piece of research that directly made that link. Not to say that someday there might not be, but I'm just telling you, it isn't true today. 82% of the antibiotics we use in our industry aren't even used in human health. Yes, ma'am. Hormones. How many people think we use hormones in meat, beef, poultry? Can't. Not approved. Not allowed. You can't even have it on the farm or in the feed mill. Besides that, there's none of them that work. They're not allowed in raising pigs and poultry. And if you see a package that says there are no hormones in there, it must state federal regulations prohibit the use of hormones on that package. There was a very large poultry producer a few years ago came out with our chickens are hormone free. Well, it was a marketing ploy is what it amounted to. And so Purdue Farms down the road says, well, our chickens are hormone free too because there isn't any hormones out there we can feed. We went down that route of testing. I, I can tell you, we did, but we didn't use them. Now, the dairy industry did adopt uh, bovine somatotrophin, which is a naturally occurring product within the, the animal. But consumers said, we don't want that. And so they have now turned that, that around, and they don't use it anymore because the guy that buys the milk from them, Prairie Farms or whoever, says, we're not buying it if you use that, because we can't sell it. And we want our customers happy. Well, that's what happens. Environmental stewardship, that's another area where we get a lot of dings. Farmers, if you think about it, are the original recyclers. 
We've used this product that we get as a, a waste and turned it into gold as fertilizer by applying it to the land to raise the crops to feed the next generation of, of animals. Yes, ma'am. And it's very important that we have, and you'll see a lot of modern operations that look just as nice and clean as this. We've done a lot of research. I can't, I can't tell you that you can be standing next to one of those fans on that farm and not smell some kind of a flavor of organic material. Okay? But as we might assume, that smell is a, made up of about 200 different chemicals. The, we've done millions and millions of dollars of research at the U of I and North Carolina and in a consortium. And what we found that we can control most of that with best management practices, which is basically a combination of a lot of things. Cleanliness of the building, control of the output of the air, location of the facility. You know, I wouldn't want to build one here on southwest part of campus because traditionally the, the prevailing wind would probably carry odors to campus. Yet I'm here to tell you I manage the research farms at the U of I and within three quarters of a mile of Assembly Hall and the stadium, we market 11,000 pigs a year. And in 25 years, I had one complaint. One complaint. And that turned out to be the beef guy spread manure behind the lady's house. So I won. Yes, ma'am. We look at livestock emissions. Certainly any emission is too much. But if uh, we look at our percentage, it's about one-third of one percent. So we're moving pork forward. One of the things we've talked about this morning is image. This guy's got problems. And this is sometimes what some people see when they look at us. Uh, that's uh, Jeff Goldblum turning into a fly. Or something. Okay. But the one thing we've tried to do with image, one is do a grassroots campaign. There are 700 trained speakers, like myself, that are out there every day talking to people. One of our leaders just retired. He's given 225 speeches throughout California and the, and the West Coast. We've got millions of media uh, hits, if you will. And the idea is that we need to educate people. We can't take all of you to the farm. That's the problem. And show you that we're doing it right. So we all we do is tell you. One thing we have done, though, is out of the 70,000 pork producers in the United States, 40,000 have signed this pledge. And those are the big ones. And it says that we care about the safety of food and nutrition. We care about the well-being of our animals. We care about protecting public health. We care about providing a safe workplace. We care about making our community a better place and safeguarding the land that we all share with you. And if anybody has any questions, I'll be glad to answer them. Thank you very much for your help. Got us through it. No questions. I always tell people I provide a prize for the person who asks the first question. I didn't want to. I didn't want to see the audience. So what's your question, young lady? Yeah. Well, what you what I. That's the ones that have done it officially. And, 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 what the, and really what that means is they are, they're declaring that they follow these standards. What you have is you've got 70,000 pork producers in the United States. You've got um, 35 or 40 that raise a lot of the pigs. Okay, So this wouldn't include probably all the 4-H and FFA kids that have got one pig or two. By the way, that's a cooking thermometer. And you, how's the best way to test the accuracy on that? You're a grad student. Yeah? Well, you've got sophisticated equipment to do it with. But I always test mine, put a glass of ice water down, 
and stick it in there. If it reads 32, you know it's got to be pretty close, right? It's the easy way to do it. It's the easy way to do it. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. All right. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Right, right. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Very much so. You know, the problem with state appropriations, though, money only comes along once every couple of decades to build buildings and make major investments. And so we have, uh, our last facility was built in 1989. And so it was state of the art in 1989. There's better facilities today on modern farms out in the country than there is at the university. But again, with even with, quote, that handicap, I mean, I had one facility that was built in 1959, one was built in 1979, and one built in 1989. And so as I said, you know, those are when we, we got all the stars right in Congress to our state legislature. The thing is, the 1959 unit to the 89, we'd improved, quote, mechanization and facilities. But good management always takes, takes uh, supersedes what equipment you're operating with. So and that that is the part that I, I think is really important that you know we 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 need to keep in mind. It sometimes doesn't take a big investment to change things if you just do a good job with what you got. Yes, ma'am. There are some branded products that have, have gained some market share. Um, and, and again, there's, there's a variety of methods of raising pigs. Don't get me wrong, there's still a lot of people raise pigs outside. Whole Foods has a whole group of growers that raise their animals outside. And that's certainly their choice. If you're willing to pay their price for the meat, well then, so be it. I, I, you know, I, I, rec I commend them for doing it because it creates niche markets for some people that maybe don't want to go into the capitalization of building a lot of buildings. But there's very, there's very few, I and mean, this is one thing we've kind of argued. Now, we will put um, pictures of uh, producers in the, in the meat case, you know, to show their farm, and you know, there are some cases now in, in Japan, there's very specific, uh, there, you know, technology escapes me exactly, but now that you can read an app with your smartphone, they can get a story behind the meat that they're buying and the producers that produced it. And, and so I think these are kind of the things we'll see more adapted in the future here. Just like the one that I was told 15 years ago would happen with Bluetooth is that you walk through the doors of the store and it'll read you and tell you, well, by the way, your refrigerator says you're low on milk, you know. So, I mean, these things are coming. Uh, it's just wi how willing we are to adapt to them. I'm pretty slow myself. I came into the computer age kicking and screaming and still haven't survived as we see the things happen this morning. So, any other questions? Yes, ma'am.
I'm not sure I made it worse. I mean, I took him and put him in a clean environment. I've controlled the disease exposure that he has. I've given him a, a controlled atmosphere of cold and hot so that he will grow at his full growth potential and he'll achieve that efficiently. See, the, the thing that happens when you feed a pig outside, and let's say out there this morning it was 24 degrees, it takes a lot more calories for him to get through the day. So it takes more food for him to consume in order to make a pound of pork. By moving inside, the average today is about three pounds of grain per pound of pork. Outside, it's probably more like four and a half to five. So that's more efficient. And that, that gives the opportunity for that grain to go someplace else, that extra grain. Well, we're, not, we're not giving him any less than his needs, but we don't waste it like when you used to have a big trough out in the outside. You have to compare the two systems. Today we have a, we have a, a little nipple water, is what it's called. And the pig goes up and he pinches it with his mouth and it'll put out water. The, the rule is it should put out 32 ounces of water every minute. So if he gets a quick, cool, fresh drink, you know, we don't have any spoiled water. It's all fresh coming into him. Uh, it allows us to make sure that, that we soften the water. We take out all the, you know, the iron and the sulfides and those kind of things so that he has a, he has a fresh water supply. And he only drinks what he needs. Yes, exactly. Well, that's, I mean, either it takes this much to raise a pound of pork or it takes this much to raise that same pound of pork in just a different environment, different controls. No, 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 no. No. Protein, protein is... 73% water, right? We ain't going to put a pound on unless we give him 73% water or at least meet his needs. And you can correlate very directly. One way we measure health of an animal is we use water monitors and feed monitors that would uh, allow us to, to identify if they're not drinking what we think they should be drinking, then there's possibly either a flu or, you know, so we can, we can identify an, an issue before it happens. Because how do you feel when you have the flu? You want to curl up in the corner and put a blanket over your head and just vegetate, right? You're not going to worry about getting up and eating, getting up and drinking, and, you know, just use it. So, you know, initially that's a good way to monitor the health of our animals. And again, we can't do that if they're outside. And again, don't, don't get me wrong. I'm not advocating it's the only way to go. There's a lot of people out there still raise pigs outside, and God bless them. You know, it, it still allows them to choose how they want to do it. And I'm all for that. But you have to weigh the consequences. You know, the, the World Food Organization says that the only way that we can achieve these needs of our growing population is to join these methods of production, old and modern, and together, together we can meet the needs of this new population and create a sustainability. Yes, ma'am. You know, that's, a, that's an interesting point. Certainly we've worked, we've worked on lowering the ingredients that we put in there, meaning the sodium, the, the nitrates, the all those things that make a hot dog a hot dog, so to speak. Uh, certainly, there's always concerns about quality, meaning, you know, how, what the eating quality is and the nutrition in preparation of it. Um, I, my, my first job out of my uh, undergrad was I worked at Wilson Meat Company down in Oklahoma City in the, quote, Frankfurter plant. Believe me, the improvement we've made in USDA regs for a hot dog is, uh, is like a great milestone in itself. Because in those days, which is ancient history now, uh, there was one reg that I just always found fault with. And it says you're only allowed so many parts per million 
scrap pieces and hot dogs. You know, as far as I was concerned, it was zero. You know, I mean, that just wasn't right. But it was allowable. We don't do that anymore. I mean, that's important. I know. But, yeah, the, the research directly with hot dogs is, is still ongoing every day, as well as other prepared meats, deli meats, because it's still a big part of our business is the, is the, uh, the uh, cured meat business. Yes, ma'am, in the back. What, what, do you, what do you consider long periods of time? I'm, I'm sorry, I don't believe I can buy that. If, if you could show me data or show me someplace that says that, I could challenge it. But uh, I can't imagine. It's, it's, it's a process. Everything goes in, is digested. And, and now we know that some fiber will hang around because... It just, that's its nature. It becomes hydroscopic and draws water and maybe, you know, either goes faster or slower through your metabolism. But I don't think there's a, a, a differentiation in pork. Now, if you eat too much fat, you know where it ends up. That may hang around on your body too long. Anybody else? Yes, ma'am. Forced you to, did they? <laughs> yeah. Anyway, the professor took us to ISP in Thailand. And they were, the, the hogs were seen to be lean. Mm -hmm. And he made a statement that it was really annoying to let them be in there in the sink because that would just show a boredom. And so for me, I wonder. Yeah. yeah. But I, I wonder what are they doing, you know, because it is an animal, but yet it's got these things that can absorb stuff. You, you hit the nail on the head. You are going to get bored if you are in there. You're not a pig. Um, they do show uh, behavioral instincts to play with anything that you put in the pen. You give them an old rubber boot, they'll play with because they like to chew on my boots when I crawl in, crawl in there to check them. Um, we have done years and years and years and multiple experiments with en enriching environments, uh, understanding the space requirement for an animal. Uh, anybody ever see the HBO movie Temple? Yeah. I was a grad student with Temple. And she's designed about... 85% of the uh, beef handling facilities in the United States, as well as many of the swine facilities. And um, she and her immediate professor, Dr. Stan Curtis, were pioneers in this area of, of environmental physiology. And I have to say, the work that we did, I mean, we, uh, we built apartments inside the pen so that they had a place to go lay down and hide. We've given them uh, twirly gig things with tires, you know. Uh, anyway. If you could just leave your evaluation here. Thank you very much. Oh, yes, we need to hand these out too. There are some handouts. Anyway, it's, it's, it is ultimately important that we try to eliminate some of that. Uh, repetitive action things, you know. But if they didn't have the chain to play with, what would they be playing with? You see, I mean, that becomes, I don't know that that's, quote, cruel. Yeah. I think we were actually trying to help their environment. Yeah. Uh, we take a uh, PVC pipe and put little ringlets on the, what do you do with the uh, grade school kids? I mean, our, our preschoolers. You give them something to use their hands and, you know, and the pig, because he chews on it or touches it with his nose. I, I 